May we pray. Prepare our hearts, O Lord, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So we are continuing our series through the Sermon on the Mount. In our text this morning, continuing on the theme of prayer, comes from Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 7. Jesus says, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses... Neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This is the word of the Lord. I want you to tell me, in your minds, unless you just feel compelled to speak out loud, if you've heard this prayer before. Heavenly Father, creator of all the universe, king of heaven and of earth, ruler of the cosmos, lord of the four corners of the planet, our rock and our redeemer, our strength and our shield, our refuge, our shelter, our master, our friend, the one who stills the storms and calms the chaos, the one who humbles the proud and strengthens the weak. We thank you, Father, that the eschatological nature of your soteriological endeavors is a theological mystery of which we are happy to partake. We praise you for your phenomenological intervention on our behalf for our justification and that your pneumatological sanctification is preparing us for a glorification of which we can hardly imagine. Teach us, Father, to keep our exegetical efforts grounded with hermeneutical integrity so that we may attain doctrinal orthodoxy. Help us to live incarnational lives as your cruciform people, acting as pilgrim witnesses according to the missional nature of your new creational church. We ask all these things in the name of the glorious and majestic and everlasting and beautiful and ever loving and glorious name of our one and only Lord, the matchless, unconquerable, victorious, unsakable Jesus. Oh, and please bless this food to our bodies. Amen. Now, in all seriousness, you've heard this prayer before. Yes. Mine was silly and exaggerated, but maybe not by much. All satire has one foot grounded in reality. And I bet that many of you have heard your fair share of prayers like this in some worship services, some revivals, maybe some open mics and prayer meetings, which are, there's some real horror stories there. And yes, even some dinner tables. Why do we pray like that? Why do you pray like this? Some of you, myself included, if you were honest, would would say that you yourselves were guilty of these kinds of prayers. Now, maybe it has to do with the passage right before this in the Sermon on the Mount. Some folks pray like this, Jesus says, in order to be seen by others. So their goal is not to pray. They may look like they're praying, but they're not praying. Their goal is to be thought of as a good prayer. I've no doubt. That's often the case. And we talked about this a couple weeks ago. If that's your motivation, you're better off praying in a broom closet, Jesus says. But that isn't his concern this morning. See, in this passage, Jesus has digressed for a moment. He's broken a predictable pattern that he's established since the beginning of Matthew 6. See, before this, in Matthew 6, Jesus' teaching followed the same structure. First he would bring up a traditional Jewish act of piety. So the section begins, when you give to the needy, or when you pray. Second, he cites Jewish hypocrites 
as an example of what not to do. Do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand in the street corners, or they love to sound a trumpet before them. And then third, he provides kind of a funny and hyperbolic example of what we called piety without pretension, be it giving anonymously, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, or praying in a broom closet. And Jesus will return to this pattern in his teaching on fasting, which is next week. But for now, he is not concerned with the behavior of Jewish hypocrites, but actually with the behavior of Gentile pagans. Now, I specify pagans because the problem is not that they're Gentiles. We are Gentiles. So if his problem was with folks who weren't Jewish, we're in trouble from the get-go. His problem was with their understanding, the pagan understanding of prayer, that is harmful to the prayer life of his disciples. Jesus says these Gentiles heap up empty phrases. Now, the King James, I think, says vain repetitions, but I actually think that's completely wrong. Otherwise, the Lord's Prayer is bad because Christians started praying the Lord's Prayer all the time. So some translations say heap up empty phrases. The Greek word there is bato logeo, and it is not as gentle of a word as these English translations make it out to be. In his commentary of Matthew, R.T. France translates the word as babble. And so the phrase reads in his personal translation, do not babble on like the Gentiles do. Blah, 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 blah. They just talk and talk, and before you know it, they sound less like prayers and more like the teacher in Charlie Brown cartoons. But Jesus' problem with the babbling is not the same as his problem with the hypocrites. See, the hypocrites do what they do in order to be seen, in order to receive glory for themselves. Wow, look how impressive that prayer was. The Gentiles babble on because, Jesus says, they think they will be heard for their many words. In other words, they think that they have to badger God or their lowercase g gods into noticing them Their lowercase g gods of biblical times were distant and inattentive. They really didn't care about what went on on earth, and they were reluctant to ever involve themselves in humanity's affairs. And if they were going to do that, it was going to take some convincing and some coercing. So their worshipers, whoever they were and whatever time, would fire religious jargon off from the hip, repeating certain phrases and uttering these wordy, magical incantations, all in a desperate attempt to get God, any God really, to notice them. Think about the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings chapter 18 versus versus Elijah. They're babbling on for hours, dancing and chanting. They even start cutting themselves, all in a vain attempt to make dumb, mute Baal respond to their prayers. Think also about the Ephesian protesters in Acts chapter 19, taunting the Apostle Paul by chanting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians for two whole hours. And in all of these cases, R.T. France says the underlying assumption is that, quote, The purpose of prayer is first to demand God's attention, and then after that, inform him of the needs he may have overlooked. God only cares, in other words, if you can convince him to care. Is that true for your prayer life? Do you struggle to try to hit all the right notes in prayer, worried that if you don't, God won't listen? Do you try to construct these so-called perfectly worded prayers, hoping that if you can just impress God with your wording, he may finally, after all this time, pay attention to you? Maybe some of you don't have to worry about this because you've given up on personal prayer altogether. You know that you aren't any good at prayer And you fear that if God's going to respond to your prayer at all, it's only to cringe in discomfort at your sorry attempt. And so you'll ask others, the talented ones, your pastor, a deacon maybe, to pray for you. But you've abandoned the notion of praying for yourselves. Why bother? 
Every last one of us is vulnerable to this understanding of prayer and of God. Every last one of us. Vulnerable to the idea that our prayers count for less than the more eloquent types. Vulnerable to the idea that God must be convinced to even hear our prayers, much less answer it. We'll cross that bridge when we get to it. We'd just be glad to get a hearing. Truly, I think this is one of the enemy's go-to lies, that God cares about a lot of things, and God intervenes in a lot of things, and God is interested in a lot of things, but you ain't one of those things. But it is just that. It is a lie. God is not some distant, disinterested deity. He is not bored with us or bothered by us. He has, as Jesus insists, time and again, you could argue that this is the point of the Sermon on the Mount. He is our Heavenly Father. Our Father. Jesus' followers are not supposed to pray like babbling Gentiles because our prayers are not some kind of sanctified maintenance request like theirs were. Instead, our prayers are predicated, they are founded on an intimate familial relationship with God, our, your Heavenly Father, who, Jesus says, knows what you need before you ask Him. Hear that again. Your Father knows what you need before you even ask Him. This is the verse, I think, on which Jesus' entire teaching on prayer hinges. You don't have to keep the Father in the loop. You don't have to preface your requests with, Hey God, sorry to bother you. I know you're busy, but if you've got some time, i got a couple things I'd like to bounce off you right quick. You don't have to do any of that because you, your circumstances, your needs, your worries, your fears... Your dreams and your goals and your aspirations, all of it have God's undivided attention because he is your father in heaven and he loves you and he knows what you need. So why pray? If our father knows what we need before we ask, then what's the point in asking? It's a fair enough question, honestly, and it's got some, some biblical and theological support. The New Testament witnesses to the fact that the Holy Spirit offers prayers on our behalf when we just can't seem to find the words. And it witnesses to the fact that Jesus, the Son, the second member of the Trinity, intercedes for us always in the presence of the Father. This is a powerful truth, and another sermon, that in those times when we don't know what to pray, or are in such poor straits that we can't bring ourselves to pray. The Spirit and the Son are both praying on our behalf. But important though that is, this question, why bother praying, completely misses Jesus' point. His point is that since the Father knows what we need, we can pray in confidence, in the assurance that He hears, and that he cares. We don't have to persuade God, twist his arm, and manipulate him with impressive vocabularies or rituals. We can, as Hebrews 4.16 puts it, with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, certain that we will receive mercy and find grace to help in times of need. And as our confidence in the Father's attention grows in us, we find ourselves praying more often, not less. Sarah actually helped me understand this point. As is often the case, I was making her the victim of a mini-sermon, telling her what the point of my message was and running through my train of thought. She never asks for it, poor girl. She just gets it, comes with the task, I think. But while I was doing it, Sarah reminded me of the opening verses of Psalm 16. She's got pretty encyclopedic knowledge of the Psalms, if I can just brag on you for a minute. You can, you can yell at me later. Psalm 116, which I think summarizes Jesus' points here beautifully in just a couple of Hebrew poetic verses. The psalmist says, I love the Lord because he hears my voice in my prayer for mercy. And listen to this. Because he bends down to listen, 
I will pray as long as I have breath. This is the kind of imagery that if you have your wits about you at all, just makes your heart swell. Of the Lord, which is his name referring to his work of deliverance on our behalf and his work of creation of the universe, that Lord is your Father bending down to you to give you his heartfelt attention, you his child. And because he bends down to listen, the psalmist says, I will pray as long as I have breath. Which of you, knowing this about the Father, would not return to him in prayer again and again and again? And in this confidence, we can keep our prayers simple. You parents in the room actually get this better than most. Think about the times in your life where your children had a serious request, not something simple, I'm talking kind of big deal. And you could tell just by looking at them that this was serious because their posture, their disposition, their demeanor were all different. And they were kind of dancing around the subject, you know, looking down, giving all these prefaces and disclosures. And what did you do in those times? What did you say? I'd imagine you cut them off. You told them to stop, but why? Is it because you're impatient with them? Okay, maybe sometimes it's like, geez, come on. But most of the time, it's probably because you are their mother and you're their father. You don't need all the fluff. You don't need all the disclosures and all the prefaces. You need them to get to the point because they are your children and you love them and you care about their needs. So it is with our Father in heaven. We can keep our prayers simple with him. We can cut to the chase, choosing simplicity and clarity over rhetoric and repetition. And now, as we've noted many times before in this section of the Sermon on the Mount, we don't need to get legalistic here. Okay, Jesus is not teaching us to keep our prayers to three sentences or less. Otherwise, God doesn't hear it. The point is not so much word count, only that the Father does not require you to babble. That's not needed, because he knows our needs. He bends down to listen. He cares. Some of you might be wondering then, what am I supposed to pray? I'm supposed to keep it simple? Where's a good starting point? And a great place to start is to pray then like this. Would you please join me in praying the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen.